so folks, uh, as I was saying, you know, we're just um, couldn't be happier and honored to have uh, distinguished guests sharing uh, his thoughts about the Boyer 2030 report, any that he would like to share, but more over his overall perspective on undergraduate education at research universities uh, in the U.S. and beyond, if he wishes. Um, so I'll, in a moment, turn to introduction of uh, Dr. Wyman, but I uh, just wanted to alert folks who are URU members, especially our UVPs who might join us for hot topics. Tomorrow we'll continue this discussion a little bit. Uh, after the fact, give some time to think about uh, what we share today. And I also, of course, want to welcome members of the Boyer 2030 Commission and staff themselves. We're delighted that they're able to join us, some of them, as well as people who are participating in an ongoing book project that um, is supported by the Sloan Foundation. We're grateful to them and to Johns Hopkins University Press for uh, publishing uh, a, a volume that will highlight some of the activities around the country in the R1, R2 space where we think there's a lot of promising developments uh, that are pushing us toward uh, a more equitable or more excellent undergraduate experience for students around the country. So uh, Dr. Wyman, welcome. You know, this is a group that's uh, about 119 research universities currently, which is not a large number, I suppose, on the whole, but as you know, they educate a lot of students and over nearly 3 million just in that 119 schools. So uh, though we are kind of small in terms of the number of decent size impact, and they're the kind of students that you have taught all your career who are gonna go out and do great things in their professions, disciplines, and uh, as leaders in society. So welcome to you. And um, in the interest of time, if you don't mind, I'll just turn to your introduction and then turn the floor over to you and uh, you can talk as long as you'd like about these, this topic. And then we'll, uh, if there's time for questions and answers, I'll moderate that as we go forward. Does that sound okay to you? Sounds fine, yeah. Awesome, thank you so much. Um, you know, we've, we've already uh, benefited from many of your students' participation in our, our discussions. You know, Kristen Corwin presented for us uh, some years ago, Carl, uh, I'm sorry, uh, Jake Roberts is here at Colorado State University where we're hosted and we're, we're just delighted to meet you and uh, to get you involved in this uh, topic. Uh, so um, uh, Dr. Carl E. Wyman is, as you all know, I think the Sheridan Family Professor and, and Professor of Physics and Education Emeritus at Stanford University. We'll put in the chat Dr. Wyman's biography uh, uh, from Stanford. Uh, he is um, the only person uh, other than Boyer 2030 commissioners themselves who so is quoted twice in the report. And as I uh, shared with him when we were extending this invitation. He was, the quotation is the same one twice, and so I thought it was only fair that we offer him a chance to expand on his remarks, although it's an important statement, and we do re reiterate it in the Boyer 2030 report itself. Uh, Dr. Wyman does hold joint appointments in physics and in the Graduate School of Education at Stanford. Of course, he's done extensive, and this I'm reading from his biography on the website, extensive experimental research in atomic and optical physics. Uh, his focus has been for some time now uh, on undergraduate physics and science education. I wanna call attention to his uh, work at the University of Colorado Boulder, where uh, in 2002, uh, he helped found uh, a, uh, a still ongoing large organization. Um, I'm not sure how to pronounce it, Dr. Wyman, but the PHET group, the physics educational technology group with the simulations that are available for uh, folks. Over a billion people have, um, you know, access these simulations in physics, chemistry, math, earth science, and biology. They're, they're done in 121 different languages. There's been over 3,000 teachers who've submitted uh, lessons. This is a really extraordinary thing. They're all, of course, based in education research. Uh, free and available for folks. So with a list of publications and presentations that support the work in that area, that's as long as your arm. Uh, Dr. Wyman has been honored in lots of different ways over his long career. They include uh, being recognized by Carnegie as a U.S. Professor of the Year in 2003 for uh, research university education. He also is, I think everyone knows, the recipient of the Nobel Prize in Physics in 2001 along with his distinguished colleagues, uh, Dr. Cornell and Dr. Ketterly, uh, for their 
uh, recognized for their discovery of uh, the long theorized Bose-Einstein uh, condensates. Um, Dr. Wyman, uh, back in the day, uh, received his undergraduate education at MIT uh, and earned a BS in physics in 1973 and went on to earn his doctorate from Stanford University in physics in 1977. And there's so much more that we could say, of course, about um, Dr. Carl Wyman. He's regarded as, I think we all appreciate, as one of the leading figures in uh, teaching and learning, innovation, and research. Uh, and a great advocate for undergraduate education and for its importance and for reform of universities uh, and how we approach undergraduate education. As I said, uh, Carl, we we're very honored and very, very excited to welcome you today. Thank you for taking time uh, to reflect and share with us based on your experience and um, expertise. I'll turn it over okay, to you. Well, thank you. It's a pleasure to be here to speak with this group. Uh, just one other little piece to add to my biography that's somewhat relevant to this effort is in addition to the 30 years of studying teaching and learning in STEM, I led a large institutional change effort at the universities of British Columbia and Colorado called the Science Education Initiative, where we substantially improved the teaching of a large number of faculty. And so that has some relevance to this. So I've looked at the Boyer Report and the equity and excellence outline uh, following that, and I applaud these efforts, but I want to offer some perspectives on that work. And these perspectives are a little bit contrarian, uh, um, if nothing else, to liven up the discussion a bit. And I'll just talk for 10 or 15 minutes and then open it for discussions and questions. So. When I look at these reports, they look at many different factors, uh, you know, 11 and 20 plus respectively that they see as important for improving undergraduate education. But I have to say, I think they're to some extent missing the point or at least missing the priority needed. Um, and I say that because all these factors certainly make a difference in the undergraduate life, but what really dominates the undergraduate educational experience is what happens in their courses. And that's what occupies their main time and attention. And those course experiences are determined by the teaching practices that the instructors use in those courses. But in these reports, teaching is just one equal item in this very long list of things being considered. And I think that's a mistake to reduce it down to that small priority. And I say that not only because I think it's a mistake not to make a teaching higher a priority because it is important, but it also should be a higher priority because it's one area where we really know a lot about what to do to make a big difference. And I make this claim because researchers like myself have lots of data showing there are large differences in student learning outcomes, including equity, according to what teaching practices the instructors are using. And this data comes from university classroom experiments, particularly in STEM education, and also laboratory research that's just establishing principles of learning that are really quite general. And so I would argue these ideas really apply. We, good reason to believe they apply well beyond STEM. And probably the most compelling and, and consistent result is showing the deficiencies of teaching via the traditional lecture where students are listening passively to an instructor dispense wisdom. But in spite of this overwhelming evidence of weaknesses of this, most university teaching is still based on lecturing. And I pointed out this is really kind of the pedagogical equivalent to bloodletting and that both practices were used for centuries based on similar flawed justifications for their effectiveness. Now, although we are pretty sure most teaching is still based on lecturing rather than better research-based practices, we don't actually know. And that in itself emphasizes the problem because we don't know because the universities don't actually collect the data on what teaching practices are being used in their courses. Certainly, I've never heard of any, and I think I have a pretty 
broad knowledge on this. And so I would argue that if any institution was truly serious about improving educational quality, collecting such data on teaching would be the first thing they would do because we know that teaching practices are so important in determining student learning and other outcomes. And an institution that was serious about approving the education provided would not just collect data on what teaching practices the faculty were using, but they'd also use that data in their system of evaluation and incentives. And People are always claiming you can't tell faculty what to do, but my experience running these science education initiatives where we achieved substantial changes in the teaching of hundreds of faculty gave me quite a different opinion on this. I came to see that most faculty were doing actually just what they were being rewarded for. And because the evaluation of teaching was so flawed and largely meaningless, while the evaluation of research productivity was quite extensive and meaningful, that naturally just dominated the reward system. And so that's what focus, faculty focused on. And uh, the quality of the teaching practices they used played no part in the evaluation. So they just did what was most familiar and easiest for them while they focused on research. So, I've come to believe that the single most important thing one needs to do to improve undergraduate education is actually to develop a better system for evaluating teaching and giving it weight in the faculty reward system. And importantly, that improved evaluation system needs to capture what teaching practices the faculty members are actually using and to what extent they're using the best research-based practices and achieving the desired student outcomes. And I think if a university did that, or even better, multiple universities did that, it would lead to rapid and dramatic change in the quality of education universities are providing. And really that sort of should be the top priority. And after that, then you can worry about improving further by addressing all these other factors listed in these reports. So that's sort of my main point, but I want to change the topic a little bit to talk about some research my own group has done recently that changed my perspective on equity and I think is still relevant to your efforts. And this research was when we were trying to understand what many students were doing poorly in physics one, you know, it's a large gateway course that most institutions needed for most STEM majors. And at Stanford, like every place that's ever looked at this, a number of students do poorly in this course, and those struggling students are disproportionately from marginalized backgrounds, i.e. first generation, low income, historically underrepresented minorities, and in the case of physics, women. But I couldn't understand why these students were struggling, because as you probably know, physics Stanford so selective that every student is exceptional by a variety of measures. And so to try and understand this, we collected lots of data and did lots of analysis. And what we discovered was that incoming preparation, particularly specifically preparation in physics, was a very strong predictor of student grades in physics one. And so students in the top quartile of preparation by our measures were almost certain to get A's, while students in the bottom quartile essentially never will. And when one factored in incoming preparation, all the other demographic differences just disappeared. So all students, the, how their grades in the course were primarily limited by incoming preparation or equivalently their prior educational privilege. And that was really largely what determined how well they did in, in physics one and the demographic groups that did worse just had worst physics background on average. And although we couldn't get complete data on this, it looked like this was primarily uh, a matter of the socioeconomics of the school districts that they went to because good high school physics teachers cost more money apparently. So 
an even more striking result was that when we did a similar analysis for other institutions with very different populations, like the University of Colorado, we saw exactly the same dependencies of how well a student did was mostly depending on their background. And this is an institution, along with the others we studied, that put quite a lot of effort in improving the teaching of this physics one. And so the lesson I took away from this was that unintentionally, the instructors in physics one and large, likely in these other large gateway courses are really targeting the pace and coverage of the course to be optimum for the top third or so students who are the most educationally privileged in their K-12 education. And in the process, the instructors are seriously hurting the, the least privileged by ensuring they fail or receive low grades because the pace is just too much for them to reasonably master the material and the time they have. And so in this case, what we see and what I've come to believe is that these key college courses are really amplifying the inequities in our K-12 education system, which are well established. And as I say, I think this is we just have data for physics one, but I expect it's true in a number of other of these kind of gateway introductory courses. And so this has made me realize that while there are many things one can do to make teaching more equitable, it's really critical to ensure that we think about how our courses are taught and the rate, what we're doing. And so the courses are really matched to the students and their backgrounds to ensure that all of them have the opportunity to succeed rather than just the most privileged. So these are some of my rantings on the subject of undergraduate education now, and I'll now we just open it up for comments and discussion. Thank you for your attention. Well, thank you very much. Um, so I put in the chat, we, we, I think it might be useful if folks use the raise hand function to, to pose a question. Um, and on my screen, I'm not seeing that. Let me see if I can readjust a little. Apologies. There, there it goes, Steve. Now it's somewhere appearing. Uh, very good. Very good. And I'm still not seeing them, though. So maybe, Carl, if you see them, you could just call on them. Okay. The first on my screen is Michael. Ah, Benham. Terrific. Thank you, Michael, from the University of California, Irvine. Hi, Carl. Thank you. First of all, I, my computer was totally rebooted. So can people hear me? Is my mic working? Yeah, we can hear you. Okay, good. Um, so, you know, this is somewhat uh, between a comment and a question, Carl. Um, I, I I really like your remarks, particularly uh, you highlighted right there at the end about emphasizing how our system and the way we teach is optimized to the top end of the privileged um, students from, from high school. And we, we see that evidence pretty clearly. Um, I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit more about, you know, we, I am and I've heard you talk about it a lot, so I'm hopefully not putting you on the spot. You know, we have this research, we have these better practices that align with perhaps, you know, a broader set of backgrounds and allow us to reach students with a range of preparation. I, I like to go to our physics analogy of um, sort of transfer functions, you know, we have an input and we want an output and we need to sort of impedance match or transfer function the right way. Um, I feel like we're we're reaching a point where more and more faculty are adopting these these methods, but do you see ways to even accelerate that more from your perspective um, so that people really understand? I, I still hear the the sort of resistance of, well, we have to maintain our standards. Everything's the same. As long as it's the same, everybody should have the same benefit um, as opposed to having a realization that maybe you have to adjust to the students who are coming in versus just do everything the same and hope for the best output. I hope that question makes sense. Uh, so it seems like it covered a lot of- It was, uh, it was a rambling uh, question, uh, Carl, with comments and question in between. So, so take whatever you want out of it and answer that. Well, so so I'll, I'll start with one small uh, adjustment. So you talked about how we have these teaching practices of more active learning that are that are more equitable that help more su students succeed and that's that's the case but 
what our research showed is that even in institutions that were putting a lot of those into practice, uh, the, 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 just the teaching, uh, teaching methods specifically weren't enough to, to make up for this. And so that it really required, you know, you can have active learning and students having discussions and doing things in class. And if you're going too fast, you still lose a bunch of, of the students. So, so that was, that's sort of more, you know, the just matching to the students better matching to the students you you have and the students you want to make sure succeed rather than most privileged but getting to your question about then how to convince people to do that or convince them to adopt the i you know that's that's a hard thing to answer because that's kind of a cultural values and so it, you know it really starts i think with the it it starts at the top at the of the university, but it's really got to percolate throughout that, you know, that they have a, you know, to try and instill in the faculty the responsibility uh, for making sure all students are successful. And, you know, the, so that that's a hard, complicated thing to do, but I do think, uh, and this goes to kind of the teaching evaluation and looking at that. And one has to, at some point, really attach that back to the individual faculty members. You, because, you know, what I see an awful lot is people will, will issue reports about how their whole institution does in terms of graduation rates or something like that. But the people who can make the difference, the people who teach these critical courses, you know, they don't have to pay attention to that because this is there. They look at, well, that's what the institution does. But I think you really have to start digging into the data and digging into, well, in your class, in your, with your students, how successful are you being? And could you be more successful? And, and frankly, we're going to incentivize you and evaluate you on how well you do at that level. But so that's, you know, that's, I think, what's needed. Now, you know, it it requires a pretty serious culture change in a lot of places, but ultimately I don't see any other way to go about it. Hillary, I guess you're next. Hi, Carl. Thanks so much. It is a real pleasure to get to hear you talk. Um, thank you so much for being here. Uh, I had two questions, but you just answered my second one, which was, the, the enormous culture change that it would take to sort of value teaching in these ways. Um, so thank you for that. My now, it, just to, to substitute, I mean, I, I know it, it's a big culture change, but you know, there's a lot of, I don't want to, to sell faculty too short because I think they often are. We make these blanket statements. There's a lot of faculty who care and want to make a difference. And so it's, not quite that enormous, maybe, but go ahead. Well, I, yeah, I don't think it's the faculty. I think that's other systems that make it more difficult to make that shift. Yeah. Um, so my my main question is, you know, in the beginning, you opened by saying that that, you know, Boyer and other reports don't sort of elevate the importance of teaching in addressing equity. and and I think, well, that's, I think that's true. And at the same time, right, that this difference in preparation, you, you trace back as almost every other thing in education to essentially SES levels, right, and access to resources. And then say that, you know, even with active learning techniques and really informed pedagogy, even responsive pedagogy, it's still not like, you know, bringing the less prepared students up at the same rate. And so my, my question is, what is the responsibility of either us as scholars and academics or as institutions to change the conditions that 
bring us students so differently prepared. So what is our what do you believe is our responsibility there? Uh, boy, that's a hard one. I mean, you know, I I I can only sort of say how I confront this personally. <laughs> and you know, and I look at this and I say, well, you know, the K-12 education system in the country is enormously large and complicated and so many factors involved in it. And, you know, that if you look at me or, you know, other faculty members and you ask how much difference can they make, I just, it just seems overwhelming. And, you know, it, it calls for bigger changes than it seems like we can make. And so I tend to look at this from the point of view of, of you know, that's just too big a problem for us, but we can make a difference at the, what, you know, so we really need to concentrate on trying to address these inequities as best we can at the university level where we are really in a much better position to make it, to make a difference. So in some sense, I'm, sort of walking away from the responsibility you're asking about. But it's it's just, you know, it's kind of throwing up my hands and saying, you know, it gets into taxes and politics and so on so much. It's just very hard for individual, you know, university faculty to make a difference. Whereas in their courses and their teaching and their institutions, I see they certainly can make a difference there. So Yes. Yeah. I mean, I, it is, it's a, it's a very complicated, yeah, you know, and yeah. you know, there are, I do know a number of faculty who, who gotten involved and they particularly in terms of improving the training of K-12 teachers in STEM and in physics, they've launched big efforts. And I think they're, they're making substantial differences and that's wonderful. Uh, but that's, you know, few and far between. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you very much. Does someone else have a question? I don't see a hand. Uh, yes, uh, Dasa, please. We can't hear you. You're muted. Thank you. I was wondering uh, what the solution to the less prepared student is, because it's so, um, I mean, it's it's so challenging because if you slow down um, too much, you sort of leave behind the stronger students. Um, I mean, it's true, not just in university, it's true for K-12 as well, but yeah. um, it's, um, you know, like we can maybe bring everybody to the same level, but uh, or same wealth by, you know, taking money from from everybody. But that's also not the right solution. So, so I've been always struggling, kind of with um, like how to approach this because I feel also guilty about leaving that one third of the students behind. But I, at the same time, I don't really, you know, some of the top students already sort of know nearly all of the material. Um, so I'm not quite sure whether slowing down is the only solution uh, or if you have any other thoughts about kind of, you know, providing the extra opportunity for the strong ones, but doing requiring just the basis. I just don't know kind of how to balance it. So I, I can offer two potential solutions to that. Uh, and I, I'll say one of them that I think is probably the most realistic is the demonstrated by the computer science department at Stanford. And so they what they do is they have their curriculum quite structured and so that it's it's a basically a ladder and students come in and they start at different levels of the ladder, but then they just make it so that there's some appropriate starting level for any student that's coming in, and then they proceed up this up this ladder. 
and so that you know you have courses that some students would take and others would skip over but that the ones you know so you do have kind of lower level courses for these students but rather than sort of being remedial and then you kind of puts you on a track of disaster usually uh they're you know they're real meaningful courses and then after they take that course they're ready for the next course up that joins in with other more privileged students and so that's that's one route and probably what i would say is the most practical in general the other alternative or another alternative which is when we been developing here and with some success is kind of much more specialized where we simply developed a, a new version of the physics one course where we looked very carefully at the the curriculum and basically realized there was a bunch of material that really could be left out without it making much difference to students in terms of what they needed later on and so that was you know you can't guarantee that's always going to be the case but i looking at the inefficiencies that i've seen in course designs i'm i suspect it's often true and so we we looked carefully and we decided on certain things we could leave out and then we put in sort of uh some extra special things there where we really focused on teaching the students authentic problem solving techniques and in a very explicit way sort of giving them extra capacity that wasn't being given to the students in the regular course and sort of then gave these students a, a alternative learning path that sort of managed to move them up more quickly than uh in that way so that that we have sort of just preliminary data but that seems it looks encouraging anyway but that's i'd say a, a much more kind of individual specialized situation i think ultimately probably the the real solution is the just think about careful ladders that oh, allow everybody a route up is more going to be better. Now, you know, what that also means, though, is that you really have to have pretty good measures of what level students are at. And so you can give them good advice as to where they're going to join to be most successful. And so that gets into diagnostics and, and advising to make that work. Hey, Bill Cohen from the University of Maryland, College Park. Thank you, and thank you so much, Carl, for the really um, informative conversation. Um, I guess, you know, we're uh, sort of depressingly seeing a, a phase where, particularly with math instruction, lower level math instruction, post-pandemic, um, there's been a lot of, you know, so-called learning loss. Um, really high DFW rates in these um, intro level courses. And, you know, when you when you speak about kind of the cultural um, changes that are needed, you know, in my office, in the provost's office and, and other parts of the campus are really working pretty hard with the math department to say, you know, these, you are failing so many students and particularly students whose um, we, we, whose success we care an awful lot about uh, at such high rates that something really seems to be going wrong in these classes. And of course, given the incentive structures and the historical constitution of academic departments, what we're hearing from them is um, we haven't changed anything. We're just doing what we've always done. Our standards are the same. Our, um, our, you know, our, our instruction is the same. Our assessment is the same. It's the students who've changed. Um, they don't know as much as they used to. Uh, you, the admissions office, got rid of standardized tests. Um, the pandemic is having its impact. And so you just need to give us better students and everything will be fine. Uh, so we've, of course, tried to see if we can change that conversation. But I guess I'm I'm interested to know if you have 
if you can say a little bit more about when you talk about changing the incentive structures, um, what that might look like. And I should say, you know, these courses are by and large taught by non-tenure track faculty. Um, they are not being rewarded for their research. Um, but but does that anyway? I, I would be interested to know how you, how you would um, think about that. Yeah. So I see math as a special problem, and it's really and the problem is not math. The problem is math faculty, uh, and because I think I've looked pretty extensively at this and overwhelmingly at pretty much every institution the largest failure rates are from math. And you you have to ask, okay, you know, why do students fail math at three times the rate they fail physics or chemistry, or chemistry is actually pretty high too, uh, but not as bad as math. And, you know, the thing is, there's no, there's no objective standard about what's passing performance. And so this is really the fact that students are failing math and much more than that other departments is just a statement about the math culture of math feels it's appropriate to fail many more students where in other departments, they would be much more concerned about this. And so, uh, you know, like I say, I, I see it as a real culture D deficiency in the mathematics world, if you like. And, you know, this also, they are way behind other STEM departments in sort of their look at educational research and research practices and implementation of best practices. You know, in math, it's still it's very common to have what people have described as dorsal pedagogy, where the students are sitting watching the back of the professor as they're writing on the board. And every, everything about we know about this says this is just terrible, but they insist on doing it this way. And so, you know, I, I think when you add in the problems of COVID where there really are, you know, that just aggravates what's really a fundamentally bad situation. So I actually have a, a sort of belief that the real solution to this is simply essentially get rid of mathematics faculty doing math teaching and that we should have, you know, because we, the, the students who are suffering aren't going to be math majors. They're the great population who are going to be chemistry and physics and biology and engineering majors. And you'd be best off to just say, okay, you know, the physics department, the mechanical engineering department, they ought to start teaching the math that their students need. And you're gonna, that's probably the only way you're gonna solve this problem. Because I, like I say, it, I just see, you know, it's not just your institution, it's over and over and over. You look and you see, oh yeah, the math has much higher failure rates than everybody else. And the recognition that that's just a, you know, who you fail at what level is just an arbitrary, decision <laughs> and it says it says something about what your your belief is about what you owe to students and it does anything about the discipline so now you know i get in trouble for math people they don't like me but i i think this is just the reality we live in let me, let me jump in and summarize what for those who joined late what i've heard is the three really uh, challenging provocations you've offered, Dr. Wyman. One was you began by saying that you don't, you're not familiar with any university that surveys its faculty on their uh, teaching um, modalities, you know, and that so therefore we don't know uh, how many uh, of our faculty colleagues are using the pedagogical equivalent of bloodletting, aka the lecture. So that was number one. No university has focused on that, which is, as you also argued, um, was, was central and should be much more elevated in the Boyer 2030 report is of great significance for um, undergraduate student experience and success. Uh, one. Two, um, gateway courses amplify rather than uh, ameliorate or eliminate um, inequities. 
So the way gateway courses are structured it hasn't been addressed, even though people have tried to address it, but not sufficiently. So we still seen that as a, a gateway that's uh, narrowing uh, uh, success rather than broadening it to all students. And then the last point you just made about math instruction, maybe they oughtn't be involved at all uh, for um, pedagogy for non-math majors and rather others ought to pick up that that work and do it with a you know for the benefit of those who are going to major in different fields. Um, so uh, we've been joined by some folks. Hopefully that character. I know that was probably not the best summary, but just to remind people of some of the main points. Would someone else like to raise a question? And I would just say that first point really goes to leadership issues. Uh, and the Boyer 2030 report was oriented to presidents and provosts and other senior most leaders who might um, take on such a challenge to be the first university and to provide leadership in this respect. Other, any other questions or comments? Actually, uh, I wonder if I could just follow up please, to no. um, Garland respond in, in response to the suggestion you make, do you know anyone who's tried that, that is distributing the math instruction uh, into the disciplines? Uh, it seems to me like I've encountered it a little bit and I don't remember where. Uh, I don't, can't think of any place that's really done it on a wholesale basis, but uh, but I, I do, I'm, I'm pretty sure that I, uh, if, Sometime I'll recall where it's been done limited amount anyway. Beth Loazzo has her hand up. She is a past president of our organization at BU and a member of the Boyer 2030 Commission. Thank you so much for this uh, for this provocative conversation. We need this kind of pushing, so it's really it's really good. Um, just to, to ask, uh, actually, a question similar to the one that Bill just asked. Um, when you were talking about the sort of a ladder approach to uh, students entering and moving forward um, and the, to address the questions of, um, you know, levels of preparation, have you ever seen that working without requiring those students who, who enter with lower levels of preparation without their having to take additional courses? Because we know that many of the the STEM disciplines are already very high requirement majors that allow students little extra, quote, extra um, time to explore other fields or actually to use, explore general education courses, you know, sufficiently. And, um, you know, the, one of the, 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 the points of real tension is in those higher requirement majors, if you aren't sufficiently advanced, you don't really get the full benefit of the education that you've signed up for. So I'm just wondering if you could talk a little bit about that. Yeah, you know, really, that's a big problem. And I recognize that. Uh, and I have struggled to think of alternatives just because of that. And, you know, like I said, with the physics one course, we have we have come up with an alternative for that particular case, which I think was working, but it's kind of specialized. And in, in general, yeah, it, I mean, it is a challenge and it's, but it's one that's frankly very hard to see a way around it. I mean, you know, when we're looking at the case for physics, and I'm sure it's equally true in computer science, you know, you have some students who have two pretty good years of instruction more than the other students you know, than, than other less privileged students. And it's just very hard for me to come to think about how you can make up <laughs> for that difference without it taking some extra time. And I, I recognize the tremendous problem that this causes in the, in the length of time to degree, uh, but I haven't been able to come up with an, an alternative. Sorry, <laughs> I wish I could. Thanks. Thanks for that. I'm, you know, I'm wondering whether um, I've seen some universities beginning to talk about putting a cap on the number of courses that are required for majors, yeah. uh, part to address these issues and perhaps to inspire the kind of reform that you were talking about, what, what you've been engaged in and really trying to understand whether 
you know, the material in next course is actually really needed and whether there are ways of paring things down. Yeah, I mean, you know, I, I can't expand on that because it, because of the science education initiative, I was in a funny perspective of being able to see how the real details of how a large number of courses and co sequences and 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 courses with prerequisites were actually taught and it made me made me recognize how really inefficient the system is actually uh and you know and it it's there's lots of reasons for it but it's basically that People don't really have, I mean, I know of curriculum where they, the departments have sat down and thought very carefully in detail about, okay, what what will be covered in each course and how it will match with the next course and, and how the prerequisites will provide the necessary background and so on. But that's pretty unusual and much more typical, you see it, and, and what I saw was, you know, that that the courses in sequence, they'd either repeat some of the same material or they'd skip, you know, assuming that the students had gotten it in another case and never get it. And so that there there really was quite a, my very crude estimate was you might be able to save 30 percent of the instructional time if you really tried to make things efficient. Uh, and so I do think there is some room there. And there's also room, you know, the 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 requirements on needing so many courses. I mean, Stanford just went through a rather contentious exercise in which they capped the, the number of courses you could require, really driven by the point that you make, which was that they were they they saw that they were it was almost impossible for a lot of students to complete degrees particularly in engineering and you know i i think that that's something that really should be done and it because of the that you see what drives this is that people are sort of looking at what they think students should learn and they start always with the basis of well they learn all the things I learned as a as faculty member taking this attitude. Well, the, the students un, need to learn everything I learned as a student, because obviously that was essential. But then there's all these new things that in our field, the new developments, new uh, new thinking and, and I, innovations. So they've got to learn those things too. And so it just always keeps expanding and expanding and expanding what they require. And I think some thoughtful, you know, analysis of no, there's a lot of things we don't need anymore that these faculty, you know, had when they were students that you could reduce the the time and make it. So that's one way to address the issue you're talking about really is to just make the majors not be so demanding, then more students could be successful at them. I, I want to go back and and add a little bit to my comment to, about Bill uh, and his question and my ranting about the math faculty is one thing I don't didn't see much discussion of in the Boyer report, but I I think it's really critical when you're thinking about these educational improvement efforts to recognize the kind of unique an important role the departments play. And there's a lot of things, you know, and sort of who, you know, what's taught and how it's taught is so much determined by faculty, uh, by the departments themselves. And so it's, you know, you can have a lot of high level leadership that has great, you know, deans and provosts, but they have a lot of trouble telling the physics department or the math department how they should actually what they should actually teach and how they should teach. And so you really have to have a lot of, of the change has to be focused at the department level and you know, sort of getting departments to do things, that's another issue and providing them with pressure and incentives and so on. But I, I do think it's really 
so many of these issues come down to to the, what the individual departments are doing that that needs to be an, always a really important feature of thinking about improving education. Are there other questions? To that last point, before I was with Yuru, Carl, I was at Kansas State University and our Department of Physics there, as you well know, has a culture of teaching excellence and research on teaching. And that's the kind of thing I imagine you're advocating for is the development of departmental cultures that where all of this research that's available is part and parcel of faculty development and uh, accountability even. Is that fair to say accountability should be part of the Yes. The equation. Yeah. Other questions? Hey, I have one more question. Yeah, Carl, thanks again for the great um, discussion. Yeah, one, one thing we're working on uh, with lots of faculty is making these sort of changes in their teaching practices. And uh, I think there's something that our teaching center and others have asked for. Is there and maybe there isn't something that exists, but some kind of instrument that might help us assess um, the changes faculty are making in their courses and their teaching practices um, and how much we're helping them change their teaching practices. Do you know of any good instruments out there that institutions might use? Uh, yes, I we developed one and published it called the teaching, it's called the teaching practices inventory. And it's a, it's our best effort at a, at something we we made it so that faculty can fill it out. But if you don't trust your faculty, it's not hard to have somebody else check on what's happening in the course and fill it out. But it it really goes through and tries to capture all of the different. Uh, we sort of broke down all the different aspects of teaching a course and the decisions you need to make in the, in all aspects of the course uh, and tries to capture those in a simple inventory so it takes people five or ten minutes to to fill it out for a, well ten minutes to fill it out for a course mm -hmm. and and then we actually have a a scoring system for so it it really it's intended to provide a complete description of the teaching practices used in a course, but then we score it according to the extent of use of practices that research says lead to better student outcomes. And so you can turn this this all this data then into into a simple score because that's always overly simplistic but often useful just to to because in the science education initiative we wanted to measure to we to see how departments were changing and so this and we used and this was quite successful for showing that so yes yeah, great i just pulled it up online and it looks very promising thank you for developing that yeah and we'll we'll share that uh, link with um uh Yuru members when we um, share this recorded conversation as well. Thank you for pointing to it. Does anyone else have a last question? It'll be our last question. Maybe the University of Delaware contingent who's added a lot to the chat. Or not. Um, not necessarily a question, just a comment. I'm definitely interested, and I know my colleagues at the Center for Teaching here at University of Delaware are very interested in knowing more about um, incentive structures that can be built. Um, I think my colleague Kevin has been um, working very hard at that at our institution, and the conversations, I think, between and among departments to bolster incentives for professors to utilize these uh, practices can be really challenging conversations. So any suggestions for how to have those conversations and really have productive conversations about that would be welcomed. But I'm sure our uh, director, Matt, would, could jump in and add a little to that. So, you know, I I come back to to the idea that faculty are actually driven by you know, it's kind of a cold-hearted economic 
workplace model that they're driven by what they're rewarded for doing and so you know you you kind of need to start collecting data on what kind of how they're teaching and what kind of student outcomes they have and then you need to have a discussion about how you have incentives attached to those things uh, and doing them better. Uh, and I think, you know, now that that's that's my cold hearted economist kind of attitude about it. But in fact, with the with the science education initiative, we had part of that. We had uh, it was a competitive grant program to departments that they got a bunch of money that they could use for incentives to faculty and basically incentives to the department to to make a bunch of teaching changes and if they committed to doing these things and they got money for it so but then what we actually found in the end was probably the most influential in convincing faculty to, to change their teaching methods was actually to see how much more fun it was to teach in these more active methods that rather than just lecturing to a bunch of students who were half asleep or never coming to class to to have a class where the students were much more engaged and asking many more questions coming to class more and calling on the faculty sort of much more which they have with which happens with these active learning and and so it was quite useful to simply set up ways uh for having faculty to to be invited and encouraged to actually sit in on some of these other classes and sort of see about this and i it's always been strange to me how there seems to be this very broad based kind of cultural norm across universities that you don't go sit in on other people's classes you know that that's just something kind of strange about that i see every place whereas so we we really set up arrangements to kind of invite people in and and ultimately uh, one of the most persuasive aspects to change was really teaching was just more fun. <laughs> so there, you know, I think a way to to recognize that and how the faculty who have changed venues for them to talk about that uh, clearly make a difference. You know, we've come to the end of our hour, uh, Dr. Wyman, on behalf of all, all the members of the Boyer 2030 Commission and the staff, those who are working currently to contribute to this Hopkins Press book project and all the members of URU across the, uh, the United States, as those here and those who will watch this as a recording, just grateful to you for your offering critical insights uh, rather than you know talk about what you think's good in this report, talk about where you think we need to invest more energy and highlight and elevate uh, conversations. And if we just took to heart those three areas that you particularly emphasized today, I think you're absolutely right. We'd make tremendous change uh, and benefit the students and our universities and make teaching a lot more fun too for everybody. So on behalf of all those involved, thank you so much for your generous time and, and willingness to come share with us. We appreciate it. Okay, well, it's been a pleasure and I applaud all your efforts. Thank you, sir. Thank you.